year or where you are in the world. Um, and maybe we can do that. Lisa, do you want to start? Sure. So um, I'm Lisa Foster. I'm the Office of Academy Resources rep for you all this morning, helping you with being a host here. But I'm also a member of the class of 1984, actually. Um, and I have uh, two children who have PA connections. One's a member of the class of 12, and one is a member of the class of 22. And I'm thrilled to be here with you this morning. Super, I'll go next. My name's Katherine Carter. Uh, <clears throat> this is my 20th year at Andover. Just finished it. It was as if it were my first year um, with the, the circumstances of pandemic learning. Um, and I, I, you know, I think we learned a lot, all of us. And um, I live in Hersey House, which is, um, it's on Salem Street. I don't know if any of you who boarded remember it, but it's right across from the baseball field. It was closed for the fall and winter terms. And then in the spring, we had five senior girls in there, which was great. And um, I'm so pleased that you guys have come for an 8 a.m. Latin lesson or 8 p.m., depending on where, or you may be in other time zones besides just here in Asia. So in any case, welcome and thank you. Colin, will you go next? I'm gonna just call on people. Sure, uh, um, my name is Colin Penley. I graduated from Andover in 2001. Um, I now work at a boarding school in Maine. I teach history and Chinese. Um, and I just realized actually, I'm, I'm sitting in my dorm room right now and just realized that next year will be my 25th straight year living in a dorm. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I've been there since I walked into Rockwell uh, as, as a little, little ninth grader, so. Rockwell was seniors for much of this year, which I think was bizarre. <laughs> <for years. laughs> yes. Mr. William Brown, please. Uh, I'm not sure. I went off because I'm recording the uh, Roman art lecture. No, this is a Roman art lecture. I'm recording the one. There are two lectures going on right now. And I, I'm recording one, and I'm on this one. It's the early architecture on Andover Hill, and I'm recording, and I'm in Roman art. I can tell you, and neither one has a lot of attendees. I'm in the class of 60, or was in the class of 60, and uh, three or four people yesterday said they were going to watch these lectures, and none of them seems to have extirpated themselves from their bed. <laughs> <laughs> the best intentions of Friday translated to Saturday morning. Ms. Candace Koo, please. Hello, I'm from the class of 95. I'm from Hong Kong. I was a three-year senior. Um, and um, after, uh, after Andover, I moved on to Brown and spent a year abroad living in Italy in, a, in an exchange program. After graduating from college, I went back to work in Italy and I moved back to Hong Kong and moved back to Italy for graduate studies mm. and moved to Paris. I stayed in Paris for 10 years and the last five years I've been in uh, Thailand. Uh, working for myself in a startup with my husband and my three children who are watching TV in the background. So excuse me <laughs> for the background noise. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Mr. Jimmy Moore. Hi, good morning. Um, class of 96, this was supposed to be my, to be my 25th reunion. So um, I'm a little bummed we're uh, virtual, but, but yeah, so it is. I'm excited about this. Uh, after Andover, I uh, went to Princeton and majored in classics. And I'm now a lawyer, but before I went to law school, I uh, taught Latin for a year, um, which, uh, you know, it was my, always my favorite class. Um, had uh, uh, Dr. Pascucci at the beginning. Um, and uh, so I'm really excited about this. It's good to see people up early and excited about Latin. That's great. I went to law school before um, and practiced for a couple of years and then came to Andover. So, so have you been following the Princeton Classics department recently. Oh, yeah. 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 And I have uh, a second, uh, two things. One, I'm also a lawyer. I went to Princeton. So, <laughs> there you go. But Candace 
uh, you are in my daughter's class, Salar Brown, who is French. I mean, we're all dual nationals. I'm wondering if you knew or know her, and you spent 10 years in France? Yes, I had, um, uh, I was there, uh, I may have, I'm, no, I don't think I met her in, in Paris, but there was a I'm dinner to say goodbye. She's a, oh, she, she is, is in the a state. scientist, but she is back and forth to France, and she is French. Is a, um, French and American. Anyway, Sonar Brown. There was um no I did I don't think I uh, came across her in when my time in France. Although we did have a reunion of sorts when the previous uh, head of school was uh, retiring, and she did a kind of whirlwind tour to see alumni across the world. And I met a small, I, a very I, nice community. Know, one more quick time and I'll shut up. My arithmetic is faulty. I added 60 plus 25 and got 95. She was in the class of 85. No wonder you, you look so young. I apologize, I shut up. <laughs> All right, how about um, Mr. Dave Gravelazy? And I apologize if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. No, actually, you're pronouncing it exactly right. If you're pronouncing it in Italian, um, <laughs> they actually are stuck with the, the pronunciation Gravelisi. Um, you go to Italy and you, you say that, and they look at you really funny, but I never have to spell it if I say it right in Italy. Um, I uh, came into PA. 71, as you can see, um, with some Latin, a couple of years. Took it throughout uh, my time at PA, really loved it. Um, I'm also a reformed lawyer in the sense that I retired a couple of years ago. Um, but I did uh, environmental law. I was at the, in, the Environmental Protection Agency for about 27 years, and then with the State Department for seven years. Uh, did a lot of international environmental law. Um, and what else can I say? Oh yeah, I, I found that um, Latin, having Latin was really useful in a lot of ways, less so in my legal practice than people might expect, but it was really helpful when I needed to pick up Spanish. I picked it up pretty fast with the Latin foundation and learning the Spanish allowed me then to understand at least what I was reading in Italian. So um, love Latin and trying to resurrect it within my spare time. So looking forward to this presentation very much and, and more. Great. Great. Well, I'm hoping it'll be more of a, you know, a class exercise than a presentation. And I'll tell you, I found when I was in law school that knowing Latin confused me because I would translate, you know, like habeas corpus and stuff. You put it into English. It doesn't mean a thing. It means much more in Latin than it means in, you know, anyway, I, it, it was funny um, because I think lots of kids join Latin because they think it will help them in law school or med school or whatever. And it does help them, but I don't think being able to you know, translate the names of the bones and so forth is <laughs> particularly, um, and so I don't know, who knows, you know, I think they get many other benefits that they're not expecting initially. So, and um, let's see, I'm seeing Christine Adams. This is, uh, I use, I was on my wife's computer. Uh, this <laughs> is, this, this is Ernie Adams, uh, class of 71, all, along with Dave, uh, and over eight o'clock Latin class, it seems like it goes together. I remember many uh, mornings walking into Alan Gillingham's Latin class. Uh, and the one, one thing I remember, he liked to put us up on the board and he would say, oh lad, if you don't know it well enough to write it down, you just don't know it well enough. <laughs> Which uh, most of my last, uh, my working career, I've been actually uh, coaching in the National Football League. Uh, along with Bill Belichick at the New England, my, cla my end of a classmate at the, uh, at the New England Patriots. And I've, when I've had uh, meetings with players, I've used that line many times on the board, because if you can't write it down on the board, you don't know it well enough. So, uh, and, and I have an, an affinity to Italy. In fact, uh, uh, I proposed to my wife on a Tuscan hillside. Uh, 
Uh, and in fact, you, you, you may, if, if you've been at PA for 20 years, you, you, you may know my wife. She, uh, she was uh, Christine Atwood at the time who worked as director of development at the Academy. Okay, the name is familiar okay, for so sure. Then. I okay. certainly knew her. Okay. She was a valued colleague and I miss her. Please tell her Lisa says hello. <laughs> Will do. That's great, welcome. Um, and Mr. Jim Longley, have, have we been, a, somebody popped off the Zoom. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. I barely understand technology. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a, I had a background as a lawyer, I did uh, three decades in the Marine Corps and a little bit of time in politics, but uh, I'm very interested in history, uh, particularly from an operations and a technology standpoint, but I'm looking forward to your class. Super. All right. I'm going to begin. Um, what I would invite everyone to do is to unmute and interrupt at will. Um, this won't really be, I'll start out with a lecture and then we're going to do a little work. And this, um, today's class is based on an assignment that I gave my Latin 300 students this year. And we did more work interpreting this year, I think, than we have done in the past as a result of um, I sort of had to shift the way classes worked because we saw kids less often, like for fewer minutes per week than we normally would have. And so, and they did more homework outside of class than I would typically ask them to just because of the schedule we had and so on. Um, and lots of good came out of that. Um, things that I will take with, you know, lots of it I won't miss. Um, I, I really, you know, seeing the kids in person as we were able to do mostly this spring, almost, let's see, of my, I had 37 kids and probably six of them were remote. So um, most of them were in person and that was truly delightful. And the, the term, especially by graduation, felt pretty normal. Um, but there were some good things we learned um, doing things the Zoom way and that I will keep, and this is one of them. Give me a quick second to shift my laptop so that I can see everybody. Okay, so I've got you. And I thought I would start just by showing you three pictures. Um, and this in the upper left corner, that's a normal year. That was the fall of 2019. And that's one of our sections of Latin 100. That was my group. I've always, I start taking pictures of them. So I pop them up for their parents during parents weekend. All right, so one year later, fall 2020, um, we learned a lot in the spring of 20, um, you know, the, the first iteration of pandemic teaching and um, had gotten a lot better. So you can see fall of 2020, all students are on Zoom, everybody's unmasked. Um, and that, again, that was a Latin 300 class. And then in this spring, um, the third picture, bottom center, is I had three sections and the, this was my eight, this was my smallest section, eight kids. Of them, one was remote and he does not have the mask. And the other kids are all in here. I'm in Pearson D, which is the classroom. I'm not sure whose classroom. It was Nick Kipps for the longest time. Um, the Tang Institute borrowed it for a year. Um, it still has all the blackboards, which are great. And, you know, the declining and conjugating, it's not that interesting, but it's essential. And popping the kids up to the board um, is, I find that to be as essential a lesson plan as it <laughs> sounds like it always has been. And I'm grateful for all the blackboard space. I love the chalk in this place. You know, we don't use whiteboards. We're still with chalk and erasers and dust and um, it feels it feels right. So um, what you'll notice from that, the bottom picture is that all the kids in here were masked, they were distanced, they would sanitize their desks on the way in and out. Um, it was awfully nice to see them. And we did what we could. We tried really hard um, to integrate the remote students into the class. Um, and they, the remote kids would be, their faces would be on a screen and um, you know, it ended up working and I'm, I'm still looking forward to having all the kids back um, next fall. Okay, so this is a picture of Virgil. 
This is a discussion of the Rs of Rome. And what we're gonna do is take a look at, I'm gonna give you a little bit of historical background and um, I invite you to weigh in with um, your wisdom, with your knowledge, with what you remember. Um, and then we're gonna isolate three lines from the Aeneid and translate them. And we're gonna, in doing that, I think we'll talk a little bit about the interpretive effect of, you know, certain word choices. And the kids really, you know, as I look at, as I have them translate, our process is one, you do everything literally. You figure out where all the nouns go, what mood the verbs are, all of that stuff. And then once you've got the Latin figured out, then you say, all right, that's what it says. Now, what does it mean? And we're going to be working on the now what does it mean part. And if you've forgotten all your vocabulary, or all your Latin, that's fine. I would be happy to walk you through it. So um, by way of review or for people who don't know anything about the Aeneid, this is sort of the story of it. The poet is Virgil. Um, his dates are 70 to 19 BCE. He wrote the Aeneid in the last 10 years of his life from 29 to 19, it wasn't finished. And his request was that it be destroyed. And fortunately that request uh, was not honored. The plot of the Aeneid starts at the fall of Troy, which is about, you know, this is um, very inexact. And um, about 1184 BCE is usually the, the date that goes along with the fall of Troy. Um, we in Latin 300 read the story of the Trojan horse and um, how the Greeks sort of dupe the Trojans. And then we talk some about how Virgil takes um, what is, he, I guess Virgil, you know, he's writing at the time of Augustus, of course, when Rome is thriving. Um, but they started from this band of people who were tricked and let an enormous horse full of their enemy into the city. And so the way, you know, we look at how Virgil manages that particular tradition and sort of manages to, to pull something glorious out of it. Um, and then in terms of the politics, just to give you some dates, Caesar was assassinated in 44. Um, Brutus and Cassius are overthrown in 42. Antony and Cleopatra are defeated then in 31, and then Octavian becomes Princeps and Augustus in 27 BCE, right around when Virgil is writing. And um, Virgil's um, patron, Mycenas, was tight with Augustus. And one of the main questions of the Aeneid uh, from an interpretive standpoint is to what degree the epic serves to glorify Rome and to what degree is it subversive? And that a little bit, I think, depends on your own read of it because you can find elements. I mean, the, the glory elements are obvious. And if you look for the subversion, if you want to see it, you can find it. So, uh, but this is, the, this is the political scene. This is a slide that's a very brief, well, I mean, it's a, it's a short slide of the long history of Rome starting from its founding in 753, so well after Aeneas comes Romulus. Um, then we get a, about 250 years of kings. The, the monarchy falls in 509. Um, and then by Augustus's time, so there's, there's then Republic from the fall of the kings through the reign of Augustus. And if you see, depending on how um, much screen you have available, the reason I wanted to grab this slide was because of the little, the four little maps at the bottom, which show the expansion of the Roman Empire. Um, and what it looked like when Augustus was in charge. Um, and here's a, this is, this is that map. Well, it's a different map, but this shows it a little up close. Uh, sorry, up further close. Um, what the, the extent of the Roman Empire at the time Virgil was writing. So the Romans would have had this in mind when they were reading these particular lines. 
that we're going to look at. Okay, so here's the Latin. This comes from book six. Um, and this is taken from near the end of the book. In, in book six, very famous, Aeneas makes a trip to the underworld where he is treated to a preview of what Rome will look like. And he gets uh, essentially a parade of famous Romans. Of course, at the time Aeneas is viewing it, it, none of it has happened yet. At the time Ane uh, Virgil is writing it, it's all history. So you get this fun time. So um, I thought I'd read you the Latin. And then what I'd like us to do next, I'm gonna have us translate it together. Um, and then we will look at specific words. And well, I get, I'll show you that when it comes. So it says in Latin, it says, to regere imperio populos Romane memento, haitibi erunt artes, pacisque imponere morem, parcere subjectis et debellare superbos. Now put the little asterisk by pacis, which is a genitive. Is any of this sounding familiar? <laughs> um, because some of the texts use paki, which is dative. And you can make an argument for either, and we'll talk about that in a second. But sometimes um, it's fun for the kids to see what the, the differences are in the manuscripts and how that can affect a translation. Here it's, it's, I think, pretty minimal, but sometimes they can have a pretty big difference. So that's the Latin. All right. Now we're going to translate it. And I would never give all these clues, at least in 300. But I thought Saturday at 8 a.m., I didn't know if anybody would have had any Latin. This is, um, I, think, I think my dad talks about, I never, so here's my Latin history. Um, I went to high school in Iowa. Well, I went, I grew up in Iowa and I went to public school and I didn't take our, the only la or language we had available was Spanish. So I took a couple years of Spanish and then I went to Grinnell where Dr. Kington has come to us from, which is about half an hour from where I grew up. And that's where I first started taking classics. Um, and I quit after my first semester and I don't remember why I quit Latin. Um, and then I came back to it and um, it was, it's a wonderful department, it was tiny. And we had, you know, there were three classics majors my year. I got a lot of attention from the professors, you know, if I needed office hours or, uh, they were wonderful, wonderful teachers. And um, anyway, so much love in my heart for Grinnell. But in any case, my dad always talks about trots. Is that familiar? That's those books where the, there's the Latin and then there's the English is written right above it word by word. And so that this is sort of a trot without the vocabulary. And I've given you the little numbers to show you what order to translate them in. And I've done some color coding. I gave the yellow highlight. Can anybody tell me the part of speech of the yellow? It's the most important part of a sentence. Verbs. Can, verbs. Yeah, those are verbs. And I've included infinitives, even though infinitives aren't like technically verbs, but who cares? They're acting sort of verbally in this. So I've left them in yellow. Those, that's where you get the meat of the sentence. Um, the subjects are in red and the objects of the sentence are in green. And so our order generally will be to start, and we might change this, but it'll be red, yellow, green. Okay? Mm -hmm. So looking at two and Romane, those are the subjects slash the here Romane's vocative, which just means um, they're being there, he's addressing, it's the case of direct address. So it's two means you, Romane, you guys can guess. It's singular. And maybe just Ro unmute and shout out words. Roman. Exactly, you Roman. And then um, what you see, memento here is the main verb and it's an imperative. I think you can probably guess the meaning. Remember. remember. Exactly, so you Roman remember and then the remember governs a pile of infinitives. So you're gonna remember to do three things. Regere is the first one. The little parentheses, yeah, remember to rule. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it's parallel to imponere, parcere, and debellare. Okay, so mm -hmm. you Roman, remember to rule. Now go to green. That one's easy. The people. Exactly. Remember to rule the people. And then imperio, either ablative or dative, with by two, four. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be a word that might be fun to interpret. Yeah. So any guesses there? Sense of power, right? By power, by yeah. command. Power, yeah. command, empire. Okay, so you Roman, remember to rule the people with power, with command, with empire. All right, that's the first line. And mostly with Virgil, not always, but um, usually his, actually, I'm going to retract that because it's not always true and I don't think it's relevant in any case. So <laughs> we're, we'll stop. Let's go to the stuff in the parentheses. So high means these, that's a, here an adjective. So these, and then a, and here, um, since a runt, does anybody remember a runt? Ero, eris, erit, erimus, yeah. eritus, erunt. To be. Exactly. What do you remember? What tense? Isn't that present? It's not. Sunt is that's present. Not. Oh, that's right. It's present. It's what? Yes. That's erunt. Just... E R A N T. It's the one you missed all the time. It's the hardest one to recognize. Subjunctive. Oh, it's not that hard. It's not Imper that. It's the subjunctive. Is it imperfect? No. Rhymes with moocher. Future. Exactly. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> this is the future tense. So right. um, a runt means will be. So for mm -hmm. these things will be. And because it's a linking verb, it takes nominatives on either side. So notice there's no green in that. That's because it's linking verb sum. So for these will be, and then our taste, that's another interesting one. Mm -hmm. And, but I think there, you know, to start with the English derivative will get you well on your way to what this means. Arts. Exactly. For these yeah. will be the arts. And then Tibby, um, I think I might, fudge that a little bit and just translate it as your, for these will be your arts. There, there's a bunch of different ways to take that dative, but I think that that will do. And that word as the words in this passage go, I think is uh, less interesting. Okay, so these will be your arts. All right, what about, we're gonna move to the next infinitive phrase, paquisque imponere morem. So, to to impose, to, to, right? To, to impose Did something. you think impose? Exactly, exactly. Um, to impose and then most or where we get the plural mores, that's it's more. It's ex exactly. Custom, yeah. That's it. To impose yeah. the custom and then pakis as a genitive of? Peace. Peace. Of Peace, exactly. So to impose the custom of peace. Now, remember that pakis could also be dative. Mm -hmm. And if you mm -hmm. read it as a dative, um, what you land with, it's essentially acting as, so imponere is a compound. And it's a compound of in plus pono, which means to put or place. And so the direct object of pono would be morem. So to put the custom, and then if you read pacus as a dative, you take it to be the direct, sorry, the object of the preposition in. So to put the custom on peace. And that you have to, there's a, there's a way to make that really nice that also works. But, um, and I think the idea there becomes almost sort of a stamping idea. So to, mm -hmm. to, to make peace be a custom or, or a habit, I think is, is part of the idea there, if you read that as a dative. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so there's that. And then the third infinitive phrase, parcere subjectis. Parco, does anybody happen to remember that? To spare? It means to spare. It means yeah. to spare and then subjectis 
that's a perfect passive participle. The ones mm. having been something. Subjected. Having okay. been, yeah. And so you can almost just translate that as the subjects. Mm -hmm. So to spare your subjects. Does Parker A take the data there? It does. Yeah. It does. It's intransitive. Yeah. Um, that's exactly right. And then the last little bit, and this De Bellare is so fun. Um, yeah. And one of the kids for the, when I gave them this assignment, he went on this whole analysis of the different ways you could read De Bellare. And um, mm -hmm. one of the options he came, down, came up with was to, to war down, W-A-R, Oh. D-O-W-N, which I just loved. And, yeah. and partly because it sounds like wear down, um, mm -hmm. which they would also have been doing. But uh, in any case, um, that word we're going to have to look at, I think, in a, in a dictionary to see some, some really juicy words. And then superbus. And if you remember the last king of Rome, Tarquinius Superbus was Tarquin oh. the Wow. Proud. Proud. Exactly. So that's the like for most, that'll be the, the initial jump for Superbus here would be to, you know, to it's it De Bellare sort of to take war away from the proud. That mm. one is pretty loaded with meaning in my view. So this is what it says. I'm going to put it all together for us. You Roman, and he's talking to multiple Romans here. Virgil happens to use a singular, but he's talking to all of them. You Romans remember to rule the people with your imperium. I'm gonna leave that in Latin. These will be your arts or your skills mm -hmm. um, to impose the custom of peace or to add habit to peace, to spare the conquered, and conquer the proud. Something along those lines mm. um, is what you often will see as a translation. Okay. And, and professor, who's, who, who is this Virgil as the, yeah. uh, speaking himself or uh, you know, is this, this is, to the reader or is this uh, someone in someone's voice? This is the ghost of Aeneas's father who has okay. died speaking uh, to him. Anchises, right? Yeah, Anchises, yeah. exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, Speaking to Aeneas, cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Part, let me just have a quick look at my notes. All right. So, and I had mentioned this before. So when we're doing this together in class, um, this is the first step we go through. And the kids will come up with a good literal translation that gets all of the Latin words where they belong so that they have a good starting place, a, a legitimate starting place for whatever interpretation um, they come up with. Because if you, what the temptation can be, and if um, you've taken Latin, you may recall this, is to guess what the thing means from the vocab, which, you know, that's not the end of the world, but that's, um, I think in order to have, for there to be meaning in what you're doing, that can't be your starting place. And so we wade through all of this together. We get to a good literal translation. And at that point, that's sort of step one. And then the kid's job is to ask, you know, what does this all mean? And how can we take our literal starting point and turn it into something that honors Virgil's tone, that honors, um, you know, the context of the poem, where it fits in with everything else. And that's really the fun part for them. And we focused more on that this year. And that was, uh, in my view, a huge improvement. And something, like I said earlier, that's something um, that we will, that I'll continue to do from now on. So as we move to the step of editing and interpreting, I want to show you some of the recent, um, you know, classics, I would say uh, last yeah. year, starting with the death of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd. Um, and I, I wouldn't say it started there, but I would say that it, um, we have had to wrestle with 
this idea that classics feeds white supremacy. And I think that's a, you know, we're sort of at the, um, we're sort of we're not exactly at the starting point. This is something we talk to kids about and we've done, um, we've done a lot in the last years to try to, you know, sort of broaden the voices that are represented in the discipline. Um, but it took on renewed urgency, I would say, starting last summer. And there has been a bunch in the news about this, um, in part because there is appropriation of classical uh, motifs and you know, fonts by um, white supremacist groups in truly terrible ways. And um, so these are a few of the headlines attached to some of the discussions that have been happening recently. Of course, the Princeton decision to make Latin and Greek not necessarily, not a requirement for the, I think they must call them concentrations there now, um, rather than majors. I, I'm assuming that that's what this means, but you know, that's, that's been all over the place lately. So um, if you're interested, I would, I would read more about that because it's, you know, the, the points and counterpoints about whether, particularly in the, in the Princeton case, um, the, the language should be a requirement or shouldn't be, it's very interesting. And I think it's thorny. I don't have the answer um, myself. I love to read about it because it's really thought provoking. And I have the kids read about it too, because I think they need to see um, in addition to sort of learning the language and all of that, they love this stuff. It's, it's incredibly interesting to them. It's important. Um, so when we've been doing our interpretive work, it, you know, it, this shades it, you know, this, they have this sort of as a background. Um, and I think it enriches the discussions for them. It makes it feel more relevant to them. You know, it's, it's not the, dead language. It's, you know, very much alive in, in these kinds of debates and these important questions. So that's the backdrop. And there's a super article in the New Yorker that sets out um, what the, the professor is. Um, he's a classics professor, I believe at Bard. And he talks about the positive view of empire or the optimistic view of empire and the pessimistic view of empire. Mm. And I'm gonna, bear with me, I'm gonna read you the slide. I know you're not supposed to do that with PowerPoints, but I don't know what people's, if people are on phones, it might be in a tiny font. Um, and I thought these, these couple of paragraphs did a nice job of sort of summarizing the optimistic and pessimistic view. So if readers of an earlier era saw the Aeneid as an inspiring advertisement for the onward march of Rome's many descendants from the Holy Roman Empire to the British one, scholars now see in it a tale of nationalistic arrogance whose plot is an all too familiar handbook for repressive violence. Once Aeneas and his fellow Trojans arrive on the coast of Italy, they find that they must fight a series of wars with an indigenous population that eventually they brutally subjugate. 2000 years after its appearance, we still can't decide if his masterpiece is a regressive celebration of power as a means of political domination or a craftily coded critique of imperial ideology, a work that still has something useful to tell us. So I have the kids read this article early on when we do Virgil, just to frame their thinking. Um, and just so they are aware to look out for potential, um, Subversive, which at this age, you know, that's what it's all about, sort of. Um, but they, they love to, to read closely um, to see what they can see. And so this is sort of some of the framing for the interpretive work that they did. I have two translations for you, one from 1697 and one from this year. And I thought we could talk for, oh, it, we have three minutes left. Um, that's okay. We can stay longer. Um, I thought we could talk about what you notice 
about the two translations. And again, bear with me, I'm gonna read them, but Rome, tis thine alone with awful sway to rule mankind and make the world obey, mm. disposing peace and war by thy own majestic way. That's the imperium, by thine own, thy own rather majestic way. And notice how Dryden postpones that until the end for emphasis, to tame mm. the proud, the fettered slave to free. These are imperial arts and worthy be. So that's 1697. Note that it rhymes. Um, there's also one from uh, Mendelbaum from 78-ish, I think that I think he rhymes it also, but most of the more modern translations don't rhyme, you know, as the, as the Latin did not. So shoddy Barch from this year, you Roman remember your own arts. To rule the world with law, impose your ways on peace. Notice she reads it as a dative. Mm -hmm. To grant the conquered clemency and crush the proud in war. What do you notice as you read those translations separated by hundreds of years? What stands out to you? Well, Dryden has added a lot there. There's a lot of, um, I don't know, politicizing in it. You're, you're talking about majesty and um, taming the proud. I guess that pretty much comes from the Latin. He's added mm -hmm. to the concept like slave and um, worthiness, I think, isn't really in the Latin either. Um, yeah. Added quite a bit. But, but tame is a, is a much kinder word than crush yeah he, he takes this he takes a very different tone to tame implies bringing them into your fold where crush implies getting rid of perhaps mm -hmm. or destroying what what is there so there's e even the word choice there the dryden has a, a much more um positive tone on what Rome is doing than um, the later or the more recent one. Yeah, he's, he's basically defending the, you know, the incipient English empire there, I think is what he's mm. sort of like adopted at least one view of what Virgil was doing and imposed it on the, the history of the other Britain, I think, I believe. And what strikes me about the Dryden version is that it's, um, it's presumed that Rome has these rights. Um, you know, it's like their their own kind of dominion. They're that's their own right. They're what and and the the more recent version, it's the you know the the remember word. It strikes it, that's that's put up front. Whereas Dryden, you don't really see that command, which which I thought in the Latin was was pretty pretty critical. No. I, I had a bad internet connection, but I'm not sure repeating myself, but I feel the first one is overridingly colonial. And the mm -hmm. second is more about atonement in terms of mm -hmm. the, the approach or the, the perspective. One thing that just jumped out to me now is that awful. I wonder, and I don't know the answer to this, but in 1697, did that mean worthy of awe? Or did it mean mm. like, you know, as we mean it, when I say, well, that was an awful movie, you know? <laughs> so I, does I, anybody here happen to know? Well, I don't know for sure, but I think you're right that, you know, awful there probably in, it, it's bringing in uh, concepts of fear and awe. Yeah. You know, the Latin word, a Latin word for fear or to, um, is this deponent verb where or, which we get revere from it. It's, it's the verb, you know, that's something you would do to a God. So it means to fear or stand in awe of. Um, and it's interesting how those two ideas, I think, are, are uh, set next to each other. How about the slave? Yeah. You know, that seems to me a little more honest a read of what was going on. 
Um, yeah. I was surprised to see that and fettered. There's an overriding concept that kind of, I think, frames the context for both quotes, and that is the issue of survival and what a country or a people or a team or a, a military needs to do to prevail. And, and so there's literally two versions of the same objective, I think. One of the, um, there's a review of the Barch translation that one of my colleagues in the English department sent and it talks about how Barch translation focuses more sort of on the refugee nature of Aeneas and on the, as you said, the survivalist aspect of it. So um, the whole sort of the, the, I think the, the interpretation um, of the more recent translations, it's, you know, it's moving like you guys have noted from this uh, exalting of a, of a colonial system to one where, you know, I'm not, and where the, I'm trying to think of how to sort of summarize it. The, um, the voice, I guess, of the natives is considered and, you know, at the end of um, the, so the article I've read you the quote out of, the Epic Fail article, he talks at the end about, he, he starts by saying that Aeneas is sort of a cold fish kind of hero, that he's, he's really boring. And I don't read him that way myself, but I can see where he's coming from with that, you know, fully. And he concludes near the end that maybe what the Aeneid really is, is a story, or maybe what Aeneas really is, is a story of a survivor. And I don't know, again, if you, if you recall this, um, if you've read the Aeneid at all, but uh, Virgil models the first six books, or this is what's generally understood. He models the first six books on the Odyssey, on Homer's Odyssey, where, um, you know, Aeneas is searching for his home which now is Italy because Troy has fallen. And then the second six books of the Aeneid are modeled on the Iliad where Aeneas becomes a more vengeful character, much like Achilles rather than Odysseus. And you know, part of Virgil's brilliance is that he takes the Homeric traditions um, and makes them uniquely Roman. You know, he takes, he's, he doesn't just sort of rewrite the Iliad and the Odyssey, but he, he incorporates them into the Aeneid, which is uniquely Roman. Um, uniquely Latin and uh, honors the Greek while at the same time adding his own, you know, just as we're doing in the, in the interpretive effort in class in here, um, makes it his own and makes it Rome's own thing, um, which is lovely. So I'm, it's 850. I've got a soccer game in a little while, but not now, but I always, um, I, I, I'm always hesitant to go and I've already gone now by six minutes gone over like the kids, if we were in class, they would all be packing their bags. They wouldn't really want to, but they would still be doing it because they'd have another class to go to. So what I want to do is invite those of you who have other things you want or need to do to sign off. I'm sorry we didn't get to the whole thing, but um, I think in this last little slide, we got it what some of what I just had one more little job for us, but which was effectively what we've been doing. So um, I'm so grateful to all of you for coming. I'd like to invite those of you who want or need to leave to do so. Um, and I hope you have a super day. And those who'd like to stick around for a little while, you're certainly welcome to. But I always Thank need to so open much. the door to the exit. Well, to, to break into the silence, uh, thank you so much for the class. It just, I want to just add something to the point I was trying to make about the dominance of the need for of thinking about survival and what we face in, in any kind of, that any society kind of faces and it's just endemic with the idea of life is what is, how do we approach the world around us and what are the values that we use to 
A, survive or, or B, prevail? And to what extent do we do one or the other? And both quotes really kind of give, uh, give a great sense of that. But uh, this has been a wonderful presentation. I very much appreciate it. Well, thanks so much. I'm so glad. Um, I appreciate your contributions. I learn so much in meetings like this. Um, it's a real privilege. Not to, not to jump too much into this, but there is a very significant book that, and I, I do a lot of work in intelligence and the technology in the military and the operations world, and a very significant book that doesn't get much recognition other than with a very small group of people, but it really frames what I think you've been talking about. It's called John Boyd, The Fighter Pilot Who Changed the Art of War. And it's, it's quite a book. It, the book, first third uh, focuses on the personality, which influences the way he thinks. But he developed a concept. It's called the OODA loop, but it really is a means of framing how we as individuals observe, orient ourselves to facts, make decisions and act, and how quickly we do it. And, and it fits uh, in the sense that there are values that are attached to what are the processes by which that is done. And there's no question that Rome could was a very brutal empire, but also was respect, ref, reflective of the technology of the time. And uh, in any event, I'll just add that for anyone who might have an interest in it. It's called John Boyd, the fighter pilot who changed the art of war. And it's by an author named Robert Corum. How do you spell the last name? Uh, C-O-R-A-M. And it provides the, uh, this individual, John Boyd, was probably the dominant figure in the planning of Desert Storm in 1991. Uh, Schwarzkopf, as a general, gets the credit for being in command. But the thinking that went into it, it, is, it was very instrumental in the strategy. And I'll add to that, you know, I'm a veteran of the Marine Corps, and the Marine Corps essentially reorganized its whole approach to warfare in the 1980s based on this one author. Wow. I popped a link to the book on Amazon in the chat if anyone wants to uh, grab it from there. It's a fascinating read, but again, I'm, I'm biased, but thank you for, paying, for the reference. Uh, Catherine, be, before I go, I'm just going to ask, are you up on the, the uh, second floor of Pearson? I sure am. So when you come to the top of the stairs, do you take a left into the classroom or do you go across the opening and go to the room on the right? Go to the room on the right. I can take you on you, a tour. You, you, you are in Dr. Chase's classroom. Yes, I think so. I, yeah, think yeah, I, know, I know you are. I, I took his ancient history course their senior year. It's best class I took at Andover. It, it, was it? So I'm in the, we have now, so three rooms in classics now. Two of them have the old fashioned desks still bolted to the floor. They're awesome. We've put some big tables in them so that, if, you know, for discussion and stuff, the kids um, can sit and see each other in normal circumstances. Um, but was this room, like, did it have, so it's pretty modern now. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's very modern. <laughs> That's because, oh, the other doors probably, I could unlock, but all the, the uh, our other two classrooms still have the bolted down desks, which are lovely. And we, we had an opening of school speaker a couple years ago um, from Stanford. I'm going to stop the share. I just unplugged. Um, her name's Denise Pope, and she does all this really cool work about how kids learn and, um, you know, focusing not on grades. She's wonderful. But we took in this department a fair amount of um, something. I'm trying to think of a, of a polite word for it. Ribbing um, for having bolted down desks. And you know, but like, it feels like you should learn Latin and Greek in this building. And, you know, they're, the kids feel tied to the history of it. And, you know, they're scratching on the desks from, um, you guys know, so from a million years and probably some of the, 
they just, they, it's an amazing, they feel connected to the kids who've been there before them. And to me, that's worth having bolted down desks. And if they need to sit on the desks so that we can talk about something and see each other, it's fine. Well, um, you talked about the scratchings on the desk. The classroom across on the second floor was Dr. Gillingham's. And if, okay. he, found, if he found you, try to put your initials in the desk, you were going to be in there on Saturday morning sanding it down. There are some, um, there are some, you know, epic divots in there, you know, that I don't know if kids have been using exacto knives or how they, either that or, you know, years of boredom piled on top of you. But the kids, like, those are their favorites because they cannot understand how one kid could have, you know, um, carved in so much, but it's, it's such a fun thing for them. And I don't, you know, you never know if they write their names on it or someone else's maybe hoping, but we don't, they do sand them down every once in a while, but haven't in recent years. And I found one in Pearson A, which is the downstairs one. Um, as you walk in from the Sam Phil side on your left, um, and it's got- That, that was, that would be Bill, that would be Bill Beaner's classroom where I, I read the Aeneid. Okay. I, I read the Aeneid in that classroom as well. <laughs> Pearson A. So yeah. Pearson C now used to be, well, um, David Pottle's classroom. I don't, and I don't know who's before that, but that's academic skills now. So is that the upstairs, the other upstairs one? <laughs> Excuse me. I got sick as soon as all the kids left. No, that's the one downstairs opposite what sounds like Dr. Beaner's classroom. Um, and that's been actually great to have the academic skills team um, next to us because, you know, they're great. But that's all sort of new and it looks very office-y. But the rest of the building looks exactly the way it used to. And, you know, when I got here, there were all these plans and people were talking about, you know, renovating Pearson and on and on. And it by and large hasn't happened. And um, it was cute. The kids, they were going to, when they put the academic skills center in, they were going to take Pearson A, which is, you know, Dr. Beaners. And the, you know, it was a done deal as far as we on the faculty knew. And the kids raised a mighty stink. And so they switched and they, they took a classroom that looks kind of like this one, the more modern one, and they used that one instead. And so we got to keep the old desks and um, it's, it's magical for them, especially the freshmen when they come in and they see that, you know, with the ink wells and the, the wrought iron and it's magical for them. Um, so in any case, it's a lovely old building. Yeah. I had to teach in Gelb one year when they were putting new windows in here. So that was fun too. Well, if you had Vincent Pascucci, he would have said, the windows need to be open to learn Latin. It must be cold. We would have the windows wide open in the middle of winter. No jackets were allowed because you could only learn Latin when you were cold. That's outstanding. <laughs> he also made us sit and talk in Latin for the first 10 minutes of every class. We would have discussions in Latin. Um, you know, there's sorry. more and more of that. Um, I don't do much of it in 100, but Elizabeth Meyer, my colleague does. You know, there's, there's a movement toward teaching Latin as you would learn, you know, in the target language. Mm -hmm. um, Mostly we still focus on, you know, reading and translating, but there is increasingly a spoken element and it sounds like that's not very new. So, so how do they pronounce the Latin then? Um, I've just come to really appreciate how many different, you know, subsequent to Rome conventions there are in pronouncing Latin and you have to pick one. You know, there's the classical version, ecclesiastical. Apparently in music, you know, there's a German version of the Latin in Bach and the French version. What do they, what, how do they do the pronunciation? We use the classical. Yeah, and, and is it really um, clear, it, you know, certain how it was pronounced? You know, that is, I, I suppose, you know, it um, would, I don't know the answer to that, um, is, is the short answer to the question. I suppose it would have, you know, evolved, um, Mm -hmm. as it, of course it did into Italian. Um, but, you know, it's as, as we teach the language, we sort of teach Ciceronian Latin 
or the class of, and that's, you know, so when we pronounce it, we use the hard C's and the hard G's, you know, Gaius, Julius, Caesar. Um, so we lock our, our own um, pronunciations at the sort of the same period um, as the, you know, like the, the grammar that we're teaching, the classical sort of Ciceronian um, golden age Latin. I could add something else about history. The battle against yeah. classics is not new. And uh, Joshua Chamberlain came back to Maine from the Civil War, was made president of Bowdoin College. And his first speech to the faculty was there's something about this new stuff called, we call science. And the classics department just went ballistics <laughs> over the disruption of the classical curriculum. So somehow classics is prevailing and I credit your enthusiasm. <laughs> You know, I hope it. I hope we won't, won't lose it. Um, it seems like, like you say, it's been through, um, it's been through its peaks and valleys. Um, Mary Beard, who's a wonderful British classic scholar from Cambridge, um, she's written all these all these terrific books, like SPQR, if you're interested. Um, but she says when she's addressing the question of like, what do you do with the, you know, there's this word problematic. And if the problematic to me, that word is uh, so inexact that I'd like to know why it's problem. You know, it, I mean, I get why it's problematic, but it just, that word seems to cover too much ground in too inexact a fashion for my taste. But, you know, when asked, what do we do with these difficult aspects of classics, Mary Beard said, well, you know, make sure you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And um, there is so much that is worthy and important and from which we can draw important lessons um, in the literature and in the history, not to mention the discipline, you know, that goes along with the thinking um, to, to learn the language and to deal with the dative and genitive and blah, 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 you know, like that's a good way to train your brain to do those, those sorts of, um, th that kind of critical thinking, you know, pays off a, a thousand times, but, um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I hope that we won't lose it. I hope that dearly. And yeah, I'll do my part to see that we don't. Thank you very much. I'm going to have to run, but you betcha. Thanks, thanks for coming. Thank, Thank you very coming. much. Bye. Thanks. I should probably head out as well. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Appreciate what you had to say. Have One a good day. Just before the um, older translation really reminded me of um, White Man's Burden which is the poem by Kipling, um, oh, cool. just the language of it, which is a very much a, well, again, an argued over whether it's a imperial or satirical poem yeah. about the Americans in the Philippines. There's linguistically, there's some rhythm with that Dryden. Um, That's good, I would read that. Yeah. Particularly the word unfettered that. brought that to me, but um, I don't know if there's any connection yeah, but there, there was a connection in my head of that almost to, even within the language of um, glory, a level of satire of of the it, it's questionable whether they're wow, this is so great or eh, well, maybe not. That's ex and that's exactly the battle, I think, when you read these majestic portions of, you know, is there subversion running through it? Or, right. it, or like, do we see it when we want to see it? You know, is that a question of our own reception of the text or, or what it meant? And in fact, is, you know, I think Mary Beard would also say that who cares what, it, I mean, she wouldn't say who cares, but she would say our reception of it, like that's where the meaning is. Mm -hmm. um, rather than trying to split hairs, trying to figure out what Virgil wanted to do. Maybe the real, the real sense here is like, how do we read it? How have we read it? How has that evolved over the centuries? And what lessons can we take really about ourselves from well, that? Where does the translator's lens and voice come into what they write? Exactly. <laughs> because it does, you can't not. Exactly. And that was one of the things that was so fun about these kinds of assignments for me this year was the variety, the ideas these kids would come up with in the vocab. It was 
and the they would be wildly different from each other and it was so fun um to read all of and they loved it and i think that that's why you know they would come up with these knockout versions um mm -hmm. of a couple little lines we'd isolate a couple little lines at a time focus on those and but it was yeah. fun to see if yeah. you've ever i've I've been called upon to translate uh, legal opinions, <laughs> and you can make them say whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> I have, and I love seeing your two translations. I mean, uh, message sent, message received. I'm talking, you're all understanding something completely different from what my mind is thinking, we can't have a total data dump. Uh, culture comes where uh, my way of talking tells you a lot about me, my vocabulary, everything. Uh, so that brings me, your name's Kathy or Catherine? Yeah, Catherine. Come on, Catherine. Yeah. Catherine. When you read Latin, are you just reading it and, and thinking in Latin, or are you still trying to get more out of it um, than the words would just immediately hit you with? It depends how well I know the, the text. Mm -hmm. um, so for the stuff I know really well, mm -hmm. I try to do it in Latin. Um, for the stuff that I know less well, I'm definitely still doing some translation okay. as I go. And I say when I, I'm bilingual French English, uh, if I had to translate, boy, that would be a challenge. <laughs> it would be impossible any more than you could anyway. Uh, that, translation that whole idea fascinates me about our communication and your uh, two translations. I mean, you can't say one's right or one's wrong. Right. In, in a way, who cares? It's talking about the translator and what he is communicating. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I think, you know, these authors or the translators must somehow by virtue of their study, I think settle on what their read is of the poem and then everything follows that. Um, you know, the depth of that analysis is, um, it's truly remarkable. And, you know, I, I can see making a life's work, you know, of, of doing this. I don't know how they have time to do anything else, teach or eat or take care of their families, or, you know, um, but boy, I don't know we, how any Andover student had time to take Latin. Uh, I took Latin for a couple of years. Mr. Beanham was my first Andover class. My father had been a student in the 1920s, but I have two grandchildren at Andover. They are so overworked and just the modern world how could they conceivably take uh, Latin? You know, it's um, the amount of work. You know, the you're, the kids are they have they have too much going on. I couldn't agree with you more, and I don't quite know how to fix it. I think part of it's Andover, but part of it's not. Um, you know, part of it, and Mr. Colin Penley, you can speak to this too. <laughs> you know, there there are. Uh, whew, it, you know, it is, they have more to think about than I did when I was their age. Boy, that's for sure. And, and I don't, you know, I do think that all the, you know, social media is a huge distraction and on and on, but I think it's beyond that. In my view, you know, um, I think they worry more than I did. It's just, it's complicated more. It's, it's a more complicated existence and a more stressful existence than it was I graduated from high school in 1990, so, and I was in Iowa. I wasn't at a preparatory school, so it was, it was different much in that respect also, but um, boy, I hear you about the overworked, and it's something we talk a lot about here, 
Um, we have a new schedule that, or I mean, before this year, we had a new schedule that was supposed to help with that. And then of course this year, everything was, a, was you know, so we'll go back to that next year. We're starting the kids later in the day at 8.30 instead of eight, because that's what the science seems to indicate will help. I see a big smile, Mr. Brown. I'm an early bird, but Me too. Uh, still uh, eight o'clock class for, I, I started at 8.12. They were, uh, and, and, and they were, but you had to be at breakfast or you got a cut. Uh, it was okay. compulsory. We were allowed five and a half cuts uh, a term. What happened if you got more than that? Uh, the, uh, you were on probation and you had to do some work. Um, or maybe it gave you a demerit. I, I don't know. I can't remember. I'm walking on the grass also to get you in big trouble. <laughs> Real shame. That's a fight we still fight. Do they still put the signs up? They used to have like posts with string between them saying, do not walk on the grass. <laughs> they still put the, um, so full disclosure, my husband works for our grounds department um, and they still put the, the posts up with the string, but that's when they plant seed to grow like after it's all been messed up after, but there are no signs, but the kids would like, they walk under them and across them and over them. And yep. the point, we're, what we're trying to have them not do is make a path from Pearson on the dirt, a dirt path from Pearson to um, GW. But that is still a battle. <laughs> Seniors, when I was there, were allowed to walk on most of the grass, but no one else. That's outstanding. Because <laughs> you know the seniors would enforce that. That would be way more effective than some teacher shouting at you. Walk on the sidewalks. That is an awesome idea. Mr. Brown, you graduated, you said, in 1960? I, I can do 20 plus, uh, 25 plus 60, I got to 95. So that young lady I thought was in the class of my daughter. Uh, yes, 1960. Got I it. For four years. We're in our 60, uh, first reunion, replacing the 60th. Uh, and we had a virtual meeting yesterday and we're having another Zoom this afternoon. Good. And, uh, I wish you could be on campus for it. I'm not sure you know, I travel a lot, but <coughs> I, unlike a lot of people, I am not Zoomed out. I did watch a class, uh, our grand, the two grandchildren we have in Andover, came here with their mother and father to our house in Florida when we have a guest house for three months while you were they were totally online. Okay. And I listened to a couple of classes. I thought they seemed to work as well as in person classes. You know, I think well, I think we got the hang of it and the kids got the hang of it. The one problem for me was that what I found we never really got over was this idea that you know if you unmute you better have something momentous to say and I'm just happy just unmute and just say any words it's it, so they didn't want to like talk over each other I think you know, I don't think there was any fear they just they're you know polite kids and so that's I said to myself I'm going to make everybody unmute for the whole class today so that to try to, you know, dispel, but I think, um, I think we got a lot better at it. And the, the kid, you know, it was better by far. So last spring, um, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, the, I, I don't think we even required the kids to come to the class meetings, which sounds shocking to me, but I'm pretty sure because of how, how quickly this all happened. And, and because we wanted to make sure that um, that all kids could 
that we weren't disadvantaging kids who couldn't get access to devices and stuff. Although I think the school stepped in to help with that. But, you know, the difference between last spring and this fall where we had a schedule and we had a structure and there was a certain way all your Canvas pages were supposed to look so that kids could access all the material for the class, you know, from, the, from our online system, you know, it was much better. And, you know, I think we, we muddled through the initial um, Zoom weirdness and then everybody sort of embraced it except for the unmuting part. And, you know, we got better at it. And by the spring, it, it's not perfect, but it was certainly adequate. And I feel like kids were learning and contributing and um, I felt like I could keep an eye on them pretty well, you know, and I knew how they were doing and, you know, making sure that they were making the progress they needed to make in their classes and, um, felt and you know by by spring when most so many were your kids were your grandchildren back this spring on yes campus? they were at our house from christmas until mid-march and then they went back from mid-march until like a week ago good and uh but and last year was a disaster the spring of 2020, I had another grandchild at Brooks and they were very good. And of them really did not get its act together. <laughs> it's too bad. You know, I will tell you that I was floundering and I felt a little, um, you know, it was so nice to see the kids when they would come to the Zooms, but I, I think they had to turn work in. That was the deal. They had to turn work in, but they, I never had to, they never had to see me in person. If they couldn't make it to the Zoom meetings, I think that was, that was okay. Uh, but they still were turning work in and having both of the, you know, the, the face-to-face -face, um, th that's essential for accountability, I think. And we regained that this fall in a way that, you know, made the learning and the teaching much more meaningful. And it just, it felt more like school. It was a different kind of school, but it felt like school. It felt like we were learning, teaching, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great to meet you, Catherine. Nice to meet you. I, uh, Latin to me taught me grammar and grammar, you know, I, I don't wonder if people really feel grammar today. <laughs> I'm not sure. You know, I think we still teach it some in English classes, but I think lots, you know, to, to hear my kids, and this is also part of, you know, what they're getting at the schools they're at before Andover, you know, they learn a lot of grammar in Latin. And I don't assume um, that anybody knows a direct object or, you know, any of like linking for any of that terminology. I just, I teach it as if that piece is itself a foreign language to them, which it may be for many. And, you know, we've got to all have that sort of common baseline um, understanding of what all these words are doing. But, um, you know, they say exactly that, how much, how much grammar they learn, how much they learn about language itself in Latin and you know, I think their English writing is probably better. Their vocab is probably better um, as a result. I mean, that's the hope anyway. What languages do your grandkids take? Do you know? Uh, well, they're completely, the two that are there now are pretty darn bilingual. They have no accent in French. Oh, wow. Uh, and uh, one of them, oh my God, I Zoom coming up uh, at 9.30 by um, the time. Uh, one is taking Chinese, the other isn't taking any language. Okay, okay. But Can't bilingual is French. Um, huh. And adding Mandarin, that's, um, that's awesome. Because I, I am another daughter, granddaughter, who went to Andover and uh, she is really good at Mandarin. She's meant, and she is completely, completely bilingual, French, English. Wow. Uh, I mean, you couldn't tell which, but she has spent more time, uh, anyway, it's different. 
but she is now at the University of Chicago uh, taking Mandarin or Chinese. Outstanding. Thank you very much. Thank Have you. A good day. Thank you too. <laughs> uh, great to see you.